Hello and welcome to North Shore Fellowship's online service. Penny and I are here to welcome you to today's service. We are super glad that you tuned in. Well, I am. I don't think she knows what's going on. But welcome, welcome, welcome. In the name of Jesus, welcome. If you are watching on Facebook, would you click the like and share buttons? And if you are watching on YouTube, would you share the link with a friend so that they can find out what's going on here at North Shore Fellowship? There you go, Pop. Let's pray together over today's service. Father, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us in these next minutes, Lord God. Let us be true worshipers. Let us be true disciples. Let us bring to you everything that we have, all the great things and all the not so great things. Father, we know that you love us. We know that you want what's best for us and we know that you want to draw us towards perfection. So we pray this in your name, Lord God, that you would draw us in and you would bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Father to the fatherless, defender of the weak, freedom for the prisoner, we see. This is God in his holy place. This is God clothed with blood. our series, Faithful Regardless. It's a study of the book of 1 Samuel. 
Now, last chapter, we saw David hiding in a cave in En Gedi because Saul and his army were chasing him through the desert, looking for him, searching everywhere so that they could kill him because Saul was murderously jealous of David. And so David and his men are hiding in this cave in En Gedi. And just as they were hiding deep into the recesses, Saul stepped into the cave to relieve himself. Yeah, it's like it sounds. He went to use the bathroom and David's men said, look, this is the perfect opportunity, David, for you to go sneak up and kill Saul. So David snap, snuck up onto Saul's uh, robe, which was laying there, cut off a piece of it, but didn't kill Saul because David would not lift up his hand against what he called God's anointing. Anointed, He would not harm Saul. In fact, he showed mercy to Saul. Later, they came out of the cave and David called over to Saul across the canyon and said, I could have killed you. Look, I, I cut off a piece of your robe. And Saul was so moved that David, who was basically an enemy, a sworn enemy, uh, at least of his, would spare his life. And he was so moved by that act of mercy and kindness that he repented. He took back everything he had said about David. He wept. He blessed David. He, he affirmed that David should be the king of Israel. Now, we don't know how long that lasted, but it was temporary. But at least for the moment, it, he repented. Now, this week, David's integrity is put to the test again. And this time, he would have failed. This test, he would have definitely failed miserably if it wasn't for the courageous, wise, and heroic act of a woman whose name is Abigail. Abigail of Maon. 1 Samuel 25, 1, it says this, Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him at his home in Ramah. That's just the first half of the first verse telling us that Samuel, the prophet, finally died. Let me just explain that. Samuel is the writer of the book of 1 Samuel, so how could he write to the fact that he died? It doesn't make sense. 1 Samuel, the book we're studying, is a biography of Samuel, the prophet. He was also known as a seer back in those days. Started when his barren mother, Hannah, you know, could not give birth, could not become pregnant until she said, finally, if you give me a son, Lord, I will give him right back to you. And the Lord gave her a son, Samuel, and she gave him right back to him. He served in the tabernacle. And he was a faithful servant of the Lord, prophet of the Lord, hearing from God and speaking what he heard, regardless of the evil influences around him by Eli and his sons and others. And he was responsible for the one that sought out Saul and made him king at the people's request and the Lord's relent, and also sought out David, the son of Jesse, and chose him to be the next king, although he wasn't appointed yet at this time. Now, the rest of 1 Samuel and all of 2 Samuel obviously is not written by Samuel. They were written by his successors, Nathan and Gad. In fact, they were the ones, Nathan and Gad, that completed the works of, uh, of Samuel and wrote about the kings. In fact, in 1 Chronicles, which is another book like Samuel, telling all the things that happened with the kings and the goings-on of Saul and David, 1 Chronicles 29.29 29 says, All the events of King David's reign from beginning to end are written in the record of Samuel the seer, the record of Nathan the prophet, and the record of Gad the seer. These are three books that uh, the first and second Samuel are partially derived from. All right, that's just the first half of the first verse of our study. Um, we have 42 more to go. I won't take that long for each one. Let's pick up the story. First Samuel 25 verses 1b through 42. Then David moved down into the desert of Paran. A certain man in Maon who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean, and in his dealings, he was a Calebite. Calebites are a branch of, of um, the tribe of Judah. They only identify, they primarily identify with Caleb as opposed to Judah, so they're sort of an offshoot. Verse 4, while David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it's sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were with us at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable toward my men. Since we come at a festive time, 
Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name, and then they waited. Now note, this is what happens. David and his men spent many days helping and to protect this massive herd of over 4,000 sheep and goats from harm, from uh, strangers coming, from predators, and even from, from bandits or those that might steal them. So they were kind of the outpost, sort of guarding this gigantic herd for a long period of time. And during this time, they were having the sheep shearing time, which is when wool is harvested. The, the sheep are cut, their wool is cut and it's harvested. It's very much like a harvest festival for farmers where they bring in all their crops and their fruit from the vineyards and things like that. It's a big celebration, a big happy time. Uh, there's feasting, there's drinking, there's partying, especially for someone who's as wealthy as Nabal, who's a very wealthy man. And the workers and the guests and even the visitors would normally be welcome to join in the celebration and the lavish feast. Now, this time David was left out. So verse 10, David, uh, I'm sorry, Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is this David? Who is the son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and my water and the meat that I've slaughtered from my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? And David's men turned around and went back. And when they arrived, they reported every word. And David said to his men, each of you, strap on your sword. So they did. And David strapped on his as well. About 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. You see, David was offended, insulted, and infuriated. And in his anger, he prepared, he prepared to turn Nabal's harvest fest sheep shearing time into a bloodbath. He was going to go and kill everything and everyone that Nabal owned. Well, verse 14, here's where it happens. One of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greeting, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. And the whole time they were with us in our fields, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us. The whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He's such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Well, this servant saved the day. This servant witnessed the insults and rejection of, David, of Nabal towards David's men. And he also knew that David was a fierce warrior and would be enraged by this. And he also knew that David had 600 men at his command. He knew that this did not look good. So verse 18, Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five sias, which is 60 pounds, of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins, 200 cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And as she came riding her donkey into the mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending toward her. And she met them. And David had just said, to them. It's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male who belongs to him. Well, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feast and said, pardon my servant, my Lord. Let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I, do not see the, I did not see the men that my lord has sent. Now, my lord, she calls him my lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my lord be like Nabal. And let this gift, which your servant has brought to you, be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for you because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of, of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But he, the lives of your enemies will hurl away as the pocket of a sling. 
When the Lord has fulfilled for you every good thing he has promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, you will not have on your conscience this staggering burden of needless bloodshed or having avenged yourself. And when the Lord your God has brought you success, remember your servant. These are incredible words, extraordinary words of diplomacy, wise phrases, wise choices of words. And this is one of the most courageous and heroic acts in the entire Bible. Because Abigail bravely went right into the territory of David and his, and his men just as their fierce anger was burning and they had just vowed to kill everyone that belonged to Nabal. And in her wisdom, Abigail offered David and his men an apology on behalf of her household, an offering of fine food and wine, and some very wise advice to David. You know, he's, she told David not to jeopardize your future kingdom by shedding innocent blood in your anger in this situation. And David was delighted. <laughs> he was extremely impressed with Abigail and praised her good judgment. She changed his mind and he called off the attack. Here it is in verse 32. David said to Abigail, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you to, today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. Then David accepted from her hand what she brought him and said, go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until daybreak. Then in the morning, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him, and he became like a stone. And about ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord who has upheld my case against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing doing down on his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. His servants went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent us to you to take you to become his wife. So she bowed down with her face to the ground and said, I am your servant and I'm ready to serve you and wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Abigail quickly got on a donkey and attended by her five female servants, went to David's messengers and became his wife. Well, there it is, the story of Abigail, a wise and beautiful and courageous woman. Her name means father's joy, and she showed great courage and wisdom to bring peace into a very hostile situation by humbly placing herself at the center of it. Her appeal to David was not necessarily just self-preservation or protecting her husband. And it wasn't even just appeasing David, but she appealed to David to be faithful to his God. She knew that David had a heart after God. She knew what would make David turn from this wicked plan that he had devised in his own anger. And regardless of the offense, she bravely intervened so that David would not sin against God by avenging himself. She said these words. She said, the Lord has kept you from bloodshed, from avenging yourself with your own hands. And she said, the Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for you because you fight the Lord's battles. She turned him from doing the very thing that would have been a huge mistake and possibly his demise. This is an admirable admirable example of being a peacemaker. And I believe this is the golden lesson of this chapter. It's the lasting legacy of Abigail. Jesus told us on the Sermon of the Mount, he said this, he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. This is exactly what Abigail did, even in the height of a brewing conflict that was about to turn into a very serious bloodbath. She was a peacemaker. Question, are we peacemakers? Are you a peacemaker? Or are you just a peacekeeper? Are you a peacemaker or are you a pot stirrer? 
You know, we're called to be peacemakers, not pot stirrers. I remember a couple came to my uh, church in, in Tennessee and in the uh, introductory meeting, they said, I want you to know that we are pot stirrers. You know, we see something wrong. We're not afraid to talk, call it out and talk about it. Well, <laughs> obviously they didn't last too long because they just seem to be making trouble. You see, sometimes we think if we are right about a situation, right about something, we could just offer up our thoughts and opinions liberally in any situation and we're justified to boldly speak about the truth regardless of the fallout it creates in relationships, even if we come across in pride and arrogance. You know what? That's simply not true. We're not at license to do that. Speaking the truth in humility and love is always good, regardless of how the truth falls upon the ears of the listener. If we're doing it in humility and love, absolutely. However, quarreling about even the truth in pride and arrogance is never good. James 4, 1 through 6 says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from desires that battle within you? God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Have you ever been at a, a gathering or a party where someone thinks it's funny to just kind of bring up a very you know, controversial subject and have people argue about it? It ruins the party and it ruins relationships. Proverbs 17, 14 says, starting a quarrel is like opening a floodgate. So stop before a dispute breaks out. Those are wise words of Solomon. But what about when we are deeply offended? David was deeply offended. You know, David could have retaliated and slaughtered Nabal and all his people. And then what would that have done? Would that have satisfied him? Would that have somehow neutralized the offense? No, no. Proverbs 19.11, again Solomon, he says, A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Hear that? Our wisdom gives us the ability to overlook an offense. It's not our weakness. It's not cowardice. It's not low self-esteem. It's not the inadequacy to confront someone that that makes us overlook an offense. It is our wisdom. Solomon says here, it's to one's glory to overlook an offense. It was clearly David's wisdom and glory to overlook this offense of Nabal. And thanks to Abigail for pointing that out. Now, I want, I, I want to tell you this the example of this Olympic skier. I, I know I shared this once before, but it's really impressive. The person's name is Simon Hegstead Kruger. He was from the uh, Norwegian Olympic ski team, and they were in a race. It was a 30-kilometer race, about 18 and a half miles. So it's a long ski race. But still in all, every second counts. And right out of the gate, <laughs> the first downhill slope, they he got collided with he had collided with two russian skiers and they kind of tumbled and fell and he broke his ski pole and there they are he and these other two competitors sitting there in the snow figuring out what they could do now he could have said this he could have said you know in anger who caused me to 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 crash whose fault was it? he could have just argued there sitting there and argued in the snow or he had another choice he could have overlooked the offense got up as quick as he can grabbed his one good ski pole and his broken ski pole and went on his way and as best he could try to, to catch up with the pack. Well, guess which one he did? He chose to overlook the offense. He got back up, skied as fast as he could and raced as hard as he could, catching up to the pack. Finally, by the end of the race, he had caught up to them, but he was going so fast. He overtook the leader and in the final moments of the race, he won the race. He won the gold medal. Why? because he did not let the offense stop him. He did not let the offense cause him to lose sight of the goal that he had. The goal was to finish the race and to win the race. Friends, we have a goal to finish the race, to complete our journey. There will be offenses in our way. What are you gonna do? Stop and try to argue them out or overlook them and continue on your goal. That's what Solomon is telling us to do. Now, th listen, there are times where we have to speak our mind. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. There are times where we have to inject truth into a, uh, into a false situation, and we have to be able to speak boldly. But let's not get confused, because there's never a time 
where we do more than that. There's never a time when we, we decide to argue, decide to hurl hate, decide to hurl condemnation. And then worse yet, you know, there's sometimes we want to do more than speak our mind. We want to punch somebody in the nose or bonk them on the head. That's never a good idea. It's never right. That actually happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember? Remember this? Matthew 26, 50 through 20, 52. He says, then the men stepped forward. This is to seize Jesus. And they seized Jesus and they arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Wow. In, ver in the version in John, uh, John actually tells us the names. In John 18, 10, it says, Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. So it was Peter did it to a guy named Malchus. And in Luke 22, Luke had something that wasn't there before in the other two. In Luke 22, 51, it says, But Jesus answered no more of this, and he touched the man's ear and healed him. You see, Jesus was telling Peter, this is not the way. This is not what we came here for. I came here for a greater mission. I came here to bring love and peace into a very hostile world, not to perpetuate the hostility. He said, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. That means if you live in a hostile way towards others, prepare to, to, prepare to live hostily from others or face hostility from others. In the same way that you're combative in argument to everyone, well, you, your, you chose your life. You will experience conflict and enemy, enmity from enemies your entire life. That's what it means when we don't overlook an offense. That's what it means when we act as David was just about to and respond with insult, with bloodshed. Romans 12, 17 through 19 says this, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Uh, that's exactly what happened to Nabal. <laughs> the Lord repaid him. This is a perfect example that was given to us by the wise and courageous and beautiful Abigail. She showed us what it, the rewards of brave peacekeeping, even in the face of severe conflict. She diffused a very hostile situation. She saved her people from being massacred. She kept David from sinning against God and her evil husband died of heart failure and she married the king and presumably lived happily ever after. So, let's be like Abigail in the situations that we face. Let's act in wisdom. Let's make peace. And let God be our avenger. God bless you. Well, thank you, Pastor, and a warm welcome to you all. It is terrific to be with you again. Here we are on the last day of the month of October. Where does the time go? Well, I can tell you on a day like today, the only thing that scares me is how many things we have going on and how am I going to fit it all in? A little Halloween humor there for you. Well, let's dig right in. Well, this is the last Sunday of the month, so we have our final Sunday fellowship today. It'll be at 1230 following our service at Bell Works. We're going to have a whole church pizza party, so come on out and join us. We would love to have you. If you go to the early service at Peninsula, if you go to the later service at Bell Works, or if you watch online, if you can get there, come on out. 1230 today at the Bell Works building. Love to have you with us. I want to remind you, for the women, the women's monthly breakfast is coming up. Now, that's the first Saturday of each month, which will be November the 6th. It's going to start at 9 a.m. It's going to be at the Women's Club of Red Bank. We do have a link for you to RSVP. We would love to know that you're coming, but it's going to be a terrific time. I hope that you'll be able to make it. 
I want to remind you about Operation Christmas Child. This is where you're going to pack a, that colorful shoebox that we have at the church. You put in needed and fun items for a child in need. We're doing this in concert with Samaritan's Purse. They have a link online where they can give you all the details of what goes in and how it gets handled. But we do need to collect them early because they have to be shipped. We'd like to get them all back by Sunday, November the 7th, which is just a week away. Hey, another great ministry to come alongside. We have the 10th Annual FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, 5K Run Walk. Uh, for me, it's more of the walk side, but I digress. It's going to be on Sunday, November the 14th. Check in at 1.30. Race begins at 2.30. It's at Thompson Park in Lincroft. They have t-shirts, snacks, award, post-race message. They're a terrific organization and ministry to be involved with. I hope you'll be able to join them. I want to remind you for the guys that the third Saturday of each month is the Men's Monthly Fellowship, 8 a.m. Now, uh, that's going to come up on November the 20th this month. We have a very special location. We're not going to be over on the front lawn, and you're going to like this spot, guys. I've been there before, and we have a very special guest speaker, Harry Flaherty of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. You will be blessed by hearing him. So, guys, plan to join us. I want to remind you of our single service Sunday that's going to be November the 28th, 10 a.m. at Bell Works. Now, this is unique. This is the final Sunday of November. It's the Sunday of the Thanksgiving weekend. And what we're going to do is instead of doing two services, an early and a late, we're only going to do one. It's going to be at Bell Works and it's going to be at 10 a.m. So it's a different time schedule and it is a chance for all of us to gather together. So it's going to be a terrific time of fellowship, of testimonies. Um, we're going to have our fellowship time afterwards too. So if you'd like to bring a non-nut related snack, that would be great to have also. I want to remind you that this service is going to be set up for new guests coming in. So if you have family members or friends that you've been hoping to get out to church and hear the gospel message, this would be the service to bring them to. So a reminder, that is Sunday, November the 28th. Next up, we have Saturday, December the 18th, the Coats and Carol events. Uh, this is We're going to have the Children's Nativity during this. This is a great time to get together, to celebrate Christmas, and to collect coats for those who are in need. That's going to be at the Peninsula location. It's going to be rain or shine, and we'll get you more details as we get closer to it. But again, get it on your calendars. Saturday, December the 18th. Look, we didn't even get into the weekly groups and all the other things that we have going on. To get, uh, to get the information on those, you got to get on our email list. Send your information to info at northshorenj.org. Everything comes to your inbox. Best way to keep up with everything that's happening. Regular events that we have during the work, Wednesday, Worship in the Word, 7 p.m. on Facebook and YouTube Live. It's interactive. Just sign in and come and enjoy. Regular uh, Sunday services in person, we have the 9 a.m. service at the Peninsula location in Fairhaven and the 11 a.m. service at the Bell Works building in Homedale. And of course, for all of our online friends, 9 and 1030 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube premiere. Well, as always, we covet your prayers and hopes for all the things that go on here at North Shore Fellowship. We want to invite you to also come along and participate financially. If you'd like to, you can go to our website and look at the menu on the word give, or you can go to our QR code and it'll take you right to that page. The instructions are simple. You set up an account and it's very easy to have your financial donation come in. As always, we are so grateful for all of you who have been faithful in your tithes and offerings and supporting the mission and work that goes on here at North Shore Fellowship. Would you pray with me over this offering? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come into your presence, grateful as always, rejoicing for the forgiveness that you have provided, the salvation that you have given, and the hope that can only come from you. We thank you for the provision that you give to us, and Father, we take a portion of it now and we give it back. Father, we ask that you would take it, use it, and multiply it as you see fit. Father, it is your love and your plan that we wish to follow. Make us wise for the work that you have for us. Be with us this day. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So look, 
with everything that's going on. I hope that you find a couple of events that you can come out to. We would love to have you out for fellowship. We would love to have you out in any of the special events that are going on. Remember, it won't be the same without you. So come on out and join us. Everybody have a great week and may God bless you all.
for joining us at North Shore Fellowship Online. Yeah, thanks for being with us online. Thank you for joining with the worship and thank you for listening to the message and joining with us in prayer. And you can always go back and look at those announcements because there are a lot of offerings for you to get involved on a weekly basis, midweek, and some other weekend events as well. Friends, if you're listening to this on October 31st morning, you could come out to Bellworks at 12.30 today. We're having a pizza party for everyone in the grand ballroom downstairs. So I'd love to see you there as well. Either way, I love the fact that you're journeying with us. But you know what I'm more interested in? That you know Jesus as your personal savior, that you have a relationship with God. If you've never committed your life to Jesus, today is the day for that. Reach out to us, we'll pray a prayer with you and lead you into a new relationship with Jesus. Thanks for being with us and God bless you. Have a fantastic day.